It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce both Dr. Melinda Hudson and Greg Archuleta uh, for this discussion of the Tomanawas Willamette Meteorite. We did a land acknowledgement. On the back of your program, uh, my crude graphic design attempt to represent two profoundly important horizons of the imagination, one of which is that of, of geology, of science, and the other, the indigenous experience of the Pacific Northwest. Both very important, in some ways incommensurate, politically complex, but if there's anything that GSOC does well, it's bringing people together from various communities to talk about geology and the land that we inhabit. Melinda and Greg, come on up and thank you. I'm Melinda Hudson. I'm with the Cascadia Meteorite Lab at Portland State University. And I'm half of the show, and uh, Greg has just told me that he wants to be the second half of the show, so that'll work. All right, so context. We're talking about things in our solar system. You are there. It's called Earth, one of the four planets of the inner solar system. There are four planets of the outer solar system, and in between them is a large number of stuff that we call asteroids in the main belt of the asteroid belt. Some of our samples, including the Willamette, are pieces of asteroids. What's a meteorite? It's a rock that originated from someplace else. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're on the Earth, it's something that comes from outer space. If you're on an asteroid, it comes from someplace else, another asteroid, Mars, wherever. It's basically, you have something knocking a piece of something, a rock or metal, off of a donor body. It wanders through space, and if it happens to hit a recipient body, it comes in and lands, and we call it a meteorite when we can pick it up. So here are some samples of meteorites. The top left is a Martian meteorite found in the Saharan Desert. That's a piece of Mars. Got knocked off by an impact and arrived on Earth. Free sample. Uh, the next two are both lunar meteorites, one in the Saharan Desert and one in Antarctica. Most of our meteorites come from either the Saharan Desert or Antarctica. That's where we found most of them. And so those are free pieces of the moon. We didn't have to go there for those. Uh, the one in the bottom left is a chondrite, which is a piece of an asteroid that has landed in the Sahara. Um, you're getting a theme here, Sahara, yes. Um, the one in the middle on the bottom is a lunar sample brought back by the Apollo astronauts. And you're like, that's not a meteorite. We had to go and get it and bring it back. Yeah, but you see that little class they're pointing to? That appears to be a piece of Earth rock that got launched off in a big impact and landed on the moon and got incorporated in a lunar rock that we then paid to bring back. <laughs> OK. <laughs> And the, yeah, the picture on the lower right shows two iron meteorites, which are pieces from a an asteroid somewhere, on Mars, uh, as photographed by the Curiosity rover in Gale Crater. So this is planetary rock swapping that's going on in the inner solar system. So we need to talk a little bit about how we classify meteorites. Um, and to a first order, you can say it's metal, it's rock, or it's a 50-50 mixture. So we have iron, stony irons, and stony meteorites. But that's not really that useful. What's more useful is, is it a chondrite or isn't it? And you're like, uh-huh, I've never heard that word before. Chondrites are leftover building blocks. They are the material that was dust and small particles in the solar nebula when we were building our solar system. And they've never seen substantial secondary processing. They've never melted and undergone any kind of chemical differentiation. So when you look at chemical elements in chondrites, such as the ratio of magnesium to silicon or calcium to aluminum, it's identical to those ratios in our sun. It's what are, was solid in the area wherever you were building these particular rocks. Everything else has melted and gone through what's called a chemical differentiation, where you've separated out the heavy stuff, which is metal to make a core, and floated the light stuff, which is the lightest rock to make a crust, 
and stuck the dense rock in between, giving us something that looks like the earth, which has a crust, a mantle, and a core. So if we look at these, these are chondrites. They're named for the little round beads that are called chondrules. And if you've ever seen a picture of an astronaut trying to drink in space, and they're squirting their tang, and little bubbles of juice are floating everywhere, if you melt rock in zero G, you get little round blobs of magma. And they cool to make little teeny weeny volcanic rocks. And then they all come together to form a sedimentary rock made of little teeny weeny round volcanic rocks. And then they're slightly warmed enough to be slightly metamorphosed. So they're kind of all three types of rocks in one rock. And so that's what these are. Um, the thing that differs from one group of chondrites to another is what did you do with the metal? And what did you do with the carbon and the oxygen and the nitrogen, the things that don't normally make rocks? And so some of these, all of the iron has oxidized. It's all in rocks. Others of these, it's not, and it's all in metal. And a bunch of them are somewhere in between. And so you can see little flecks of metal and sulfide in some of these, but not all of these. The differentiated meteorites, you're looking at the irons, which are cores of asteroids. And the last estimate I saw was somewhere going on to 100 different asteroid cores. So it's a lot that have had collisions of an unfortunate kind that trashed the rocky part of the asteroid and left the metal behind. Um, the uralite is an ultramafic rock, so it's a mantle from somewhere. And I know it doesn't look like it, but Milba Lily, and these are named for the places that they're found, and this is from Australia. All the really interesting sounding names are from Australia, like Calcalon Creek and Milba Lily. Um, that's a basalt. Now, I know you guys don't believe it, but the chemistry is slightly different. Things like the abundance of manganese and chromium and whatnot. So the plagioclase feldspar is blindingly white and the pyroxene is light gray. And so instead of having a dark rock, you have a very pale rock, but it's still a basalt. It's basically half pyroxene and half feldspar. We have things that are 50-50. We're not sure whether they form by collisions, whether they're samples of a core mantle boundary. There's lots of ideas. It's still being worked on. So when we look at meteorites, what we see is that almost all of them are chondrites. The asteroid belt is full of chondrites. We've had three missions going to asteroids to pick up samples, and they were all chondrites. If you look at the next most abundant, at about 2%, it is my husband's phone ringing. Um, <laughs> it is iron meteorites, like the Willamette, OK? Um, when you look at uh, the other stony meteorites, you find that there's all sorts of chondrites. There's some things that aren't chondrites. There's pieces of the moon. There's pieces of Mars. There's pieces of the asteroid Vesta. It's a long story. I'm not going to go there. So my topic for today is the Willamette, which, as Paul alluded to, has value for many different groups of people. And it has value to collectors. I am not a meteorite collector. I don't always appreciate the meteorite collectors <laughs> because they don't always give away pieces of their samples, but I really appreciate them when they do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I don't get collecting. I don't know why a Jackson Pollock painting is worth a fortune and my kids' splatters that they did in grade school aren't. They, they're all pretty pieces of paint. OK, that's all right. But collectors are their own little group. There's a whole subculture of meteorite dealers, meteorite hunters, meteorite collectors, and it's not me. Another group of people are people who venerate the meteorites. And there's been a long history of veneration. Uh, the ancient Egyptians have names for iron meteorites uh, that deal with iron falling from the sky. King Tut was buried with an iron meteorite blade. Um, ancient Greece, uh, ancient Romans, 
I'll tell you a story about Traping Ranoas, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that even close, um, and Native Americans, among others. And so there have been a number of uh, iron meteorites, including Wichita River, Iron Crest, Willamette, Cape York, and Chilkoot, that were all venerated by Native American groups. They've all kind of wound up in museums somewhere. Um, Cape York is also another huge iron meteorite. It was taken from the Inuit, as I recall. Um, never mind, I won't go there. Um, this is a picture of the Winona meteorite. Uh, a cyst is a, like a funerary chamber, chamber. It's like, hi, I went to you know, the graveyard and dug up something that you had buried there for a reason. But yeah, that's what's happened, okay? So that's the Winona meteorite in, as it was found. This is a group of, Cam um, is Cambodia? Yes, it's Cambodia. Um, they were preparing a rice paddy for uh, planting and heard a sound that they thought was a missile incoming, so they ducked. And one of them saw dirt spray up in the air and they went out and found a meteorite. And then they looked around and found two more. And eventually, one of the finders who owned the meteorite brought it to the Cascadia Meteorite Lab, and we classified it. But before that, it spent a couple of years in Cambodia uh, being venerated. They would pour water over it and drink it. So normally, a freshly fallen meteorite's in good shape. This one was pretty rusty because it had been used in uh, rituals. There is a scientific value to meteorites. Um, they tell us a lot of things. The chondrites in particular contain grains that were solid for some unknown number of billions of years before our solar system started to form. So we have things that were produced uh, as supernova remnants as the gas cooled off. We have um, things that are from detached red giant stars that have the gas has cooled off. We have a large number of pre-solar stuff. We can learn how fast and how the solar system was put together. One group of chondrites contains abundant organic material, carbon-rich material, including amino acids that formed in space. They had, no, they had nothing to do with biology. But there's been speculation that they seeded the Earth with components needed to build life. So, we also start to learn something about how you build a planet. How long does it take to build the Earth? How does a core separate from rocky material? You know, there's always a cartoon. Hi, you put together this thing, it melts, the metal sinks to the center, you get a core. It's not always that easy. And one of the things that Alex and I did many years ago was study silicate inclusions and iron meteorites to see how do you separate rock from metal, particularly on an asteroid that has so little gravity that you could like shoot a golf ball off the surface into space with a good swing. And the answer is there's a couple of different techniques involved and it's a lot more complicated. But the building blocks that went to build the Earth didn't necessarily all, weren't all necessarily pieces of chondrites. They could have included differentiated asteroids with cores already separated. So. Um, we get the timing and some of the timing from meteorites. And then, of course, we have free samples of the Moon and Mars. Yes? Uh, I am five. I'm just trying to correlate a memory that I had from a presentation on meteorites in the late 90s, uh, where, if I remember correctly, the astronomer uh, presenting would explain that he was able to take sections through a meteorite and extract the chemical composition of trapped internal gases. Is correct. That, is that correct? That is correct. That's how they proved these were from Mars, because it matched the gas measured by the Viking lander. And just so you know, I believe it was Curiosity. Uh, there was another press release in the last couple of years. We've proved that they're from Mars. They left off the word again, because it was the same sort of measurement, but a little bit more precise, OK? Um, so in launching them off of Mars, you made a melt. It adsorbed the Martian atmosphere. It quenched to form a glass. 
we could get it out in a lab and prove that it's not terrestrial gas, it's Martian, okay? And of course, we went to the moon, so the thing is, we went to the moon and we got a bunch of samples, and the lunar meteorites include additional material that we didn't bring back. So we get to study more of the moon that way. Oregon is a lousy place to look for meteorites. If you go to Kansas, you'll find oh, over 100, maybe 200 meteorites that have been found in Kansas. We found six in Oregon, okay? And our lab has classified two of them, Fitzwater Pass and Morrow County. Of the six Oregon meteorites, the Willamette meteorite is the most famous and the most controversial. It's the largest meteorite ever found in the United States. Not the world, I think we're what, six or something, but it's, it's the largest in the United States. Former lab member, deceased, Dick Pugh, I think a lot of you know Dick, um, worked the strand line from the Ice Age floods to demonstrate that the Willamette actually rafted in from wherever all of the glacial erratics came from, uh, probably on an ice flow that was carried by the Ice Age floods. So it appears to be a glacial erratic that was dumped on the strand line in what is now West Lynn. So um, 15 and a half tons, sixth largest meteorite in the world, not word, okay, I can't type either, um, found in 1902 by Ellis Hughes and Bill Dale in what is now West Lynn. Ironically, found on property belonging at the time to Oregon Iron and Steel, given that it's an iron meteorite. So it was close to their property, but not quite. Three quarters of a mile, <laughs> that, that's not much distance. And they didn't think it was much distance. And Oregon Iron and Steel wouldn't sell the land, so they decided to take the meteorite. So they put it on this sledge. It took them three months to go three quarters of a mile. And what do you do with a large iron meteorite if you've stolen it from your neighbor? <laughs> the answer is you put up paper as a background and charge people 10 cents to get their pictures taken in front of the meteorite. If you're small enough, you can fit inside the meteorite, which is what they did. In 1905, Oregon Iron and Steel discovered that the Hughes and company were making money off their iron meteorite and they wanted it back. So, um, Hughes refused, it went to trial, and it lost. This is one of many court cases, and there have been several in the US, deciding that whoever the property owner is, where you find the meteorite, they own the meteorite. This is not true in other countries, but it is true in the United States, and has led to some interesting fabrications of, I found this in my backyard. <coughs> Never mind, okay. <laughs> There's a famous Martian meteorite that was found in somebody's backyard, not really. Okay, um, anyway, they moved it towards the Willamette River because they were gonna put it on a boat and float it down to Portland. And there was another court case and they paused. So they paused it on um, Johnson Creek Road. And people came and got their pictures taken, which wasn't too bad. They also came and hacked pieces off. So they deputized Mr. Johnson to go out and shoot at people who were trying to hack pieces off the meteorite. Uh, he was supposed to be guarding it. So this is uh, on its way towards the river to go up to Portland. Um, let's see. That basically says that, yes, they kept going. Um, Dick was enamored of the windlass, Spanish windlass that they used to drag this thing, and so I have a Spanish windlass picture. Um, but it was taken to the Willamette, and the steamboat Modoc took it to uh, Portland for uh, a fair, which was the Lewis and Clark Exposition in 1905. Um, there's a very large uh, train of horses dragging the well, I'm, it's still on its sledge. That's still the sledge that Hughes stole it, you know, from Oregon Iron Steel originally, covered with a flag, and then still on its sledge with a guard guarding it so that nobody can go in and, you know, hat more pieces off. So it was exhibited, woohoo! And then after the exhibit, Oregon Iron and Steel sold it to 
somebody who was wealthy for $26,000, which in 1905 must have been an obscenely huge amount of money. I don't know what that would be in 2022 dollars, but that's a lot of money. And she donated it to the American Museum of Natural History. I will tell you that most people who spend, oh, millions of dollars on meteorites right now don't donate them to Portland State. Okay. Uh, this is a picture taken uh, as it's going to the museum, and it's heavy enough that the wheels are sinking into the pavement. It was displayed in the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, they were very proud of the meteorite until the Boy Scouts, I think it was the Boy Scouts, school kids from Lake Oswego campaigned to get it back. There was a lot of bad airplay and bad cartoons as well. At that point, they were getting ready to build a new planetarium, and so they built a new planetarium around the meteorite, so it cannot easily be removed. You have to tear down part of the building to get it out. And I think that was in response to the kids from Lake Oswego. Anyway, um, so there it is in its new display on the new uh, Hayden Planetarium, and there were more lawsuits. So in his failed lawsuit, Ellis Hughes had said that this was an object sacred to the Clackamas tribe, and somebody started saying that there was going to be a Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act against the museum. Uh, the museum sued the Grand Ron, as I understand, and everybody settled out of court and I'm sure that Greg will talk about the settlement and uh, what's going on after that. But they reached a, an agreement where it's still in New York, but the Grand Ron has access to it, is my understanding. Greg will tell us more. And then there were more lawsuits. This has been a very sued over meteorite. So a meteorite dealer named Daryl Pitt had traded with the Natural History Museum there was a piece that had been cut off because people kept banging their heads into it, and it was considered a hazard, so they cut it off and put it in a back room. Daryl Pitt decided to sell it for a lot of money through one of the primo auction sites, you know, like Christie's or someplace like that. Um, there was an article claiming insensitivity to the Grand Ron, editorial in the Oregonian. Um, the bidders uh, for the meteorite dropped out, the Grand Ronde denied the Oregonian's claim. The owner sued the Oregonian and lost. This is Daryl Pitt versus Advanced Publications. Daryl Pitt then cut this piece into smaller pieces to sell at a cheaper price. In 2006, a piece was sold to Evergreen Aviation Museum, again with controversy. They decided they didn't want the controversy and they donated the piece to the Grand Ronde. Take a look at the inclusions in this, the troilite inclusions. Notice the shape, there's an oval and a little pointy thing, because you'll see that again. Because of all the controversy, the Natural History Museum will not let anybody have a piece for research. So this is one of the least studied iron meteorites on the face of the earth. Um, and it's, this is from a paper that was done uh, a long time ago, and it shows that the texture is different from different pieces, so it's an unusual meteorite. Before Daryl Pitt sold his piece to the Evergreen Aviation Museum, he went by some people at UCLA and said, I'd like my name on a publication. Would you like to analyze this before I get rid of it? And you notice he's the last author on this paper, which is the only recent research that's been done on the Willamette. So I'm going to leave it there. I will like to say that me, my husband, and uh, Dick Pugh founded the Cascadia Meteorite Lab a long time ago at this point, 20 years. And Dick was all about the Willamette. It was his favorite meteorite on the planet. And he wanted very much to have a paid curatorial position for the lab, which we don't yet have. So if you have abundant money after you donate to GSOC, <laughs> there is a Dick Pugh Memorial campaign to raise money for a curator for our lab as opposed to me volunteering. So um, you can go online to our website and find Dick Pugh Memorial campaign and any amount of money is appreciated. Thank you and I'll hand it over to Greg.
So I am kind of waiting till they come. And I can miss like a couple of streets, tum tum, and I can miss like a call uksan, a couple of uk ilihi, and I can sawas ilihi till they come, and I can name Greg Archuleta. So I just wanted to first welcome you in our tribal language that we speak today at the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, which is the Chiduk Wawa, and just said uh, I've been ha happy to be here um, at this place today with you all and that I'm a member of the tribe, Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde, and my name is Greg Archuleta. And I must, myself, as a member of the tribe and descended from the Clackamas Chinook, uh, Willamette Tumwaters, Cascades, Santiam Kalapuya Shasta, and uh, Tukelma. And those are my tribal families uh, tied to Grand Ronde. And um, it's uh, great to be here today. Um, and uh, the topic, of course, is the Willamette meteorite, which we call Tomonos. We have different, ver there's variations in the, in, the, in the language and how it's said and things like that. So um, we also have a very, uh, another term, Tomonos, um, that we'll kind of share with today. And kind of to share today about uh, um, Tomonos, what, I'd like to do is kind of really present a picture of, of the cultural landscape here prior to contact and the life ways of the tribes here. Um, the focus here is on the, uh, the meteorite and its location and use by the Clackamas Chinook people. Um, and our tribes, um, very interesting because we can kind of do a con comparative kind of thing of looking at the tribe's perspective versus and the scientific perspective. And in our old stories, we have old stories in Chinook Wawa, we call them econom, those ancient stories that have been passed down generation to generation. And uh, you're very fortunate because it's kind of um, outside now, kind of the storytelling season, which is winter time, which is kind of hard to tell outside, but uh, we've had other signs that uh, spring is coming, so it's kind of outside now, that storytelling time. But some of those stories are very, very long, so we'd be here a very, very long time if I start sharing some of those stories. Um, so I'll just give you some little teasers and things like that about the old stories, and there's taboos, so hopefully nothing happens after I share a little pieces <laughs> too. But, uh, um, we have lots of different stories in our tribes of this region, including the Clackamas. Um, just a kind of a history, quick history of the tribes if you're not familiar with, but uh, in this area here is the ancestral homelands of the Clackamas people, which went uh, along the Columbia River from about uh, um, the Sandy River area to the Willamette River, up to Oregon City, um, to the falls, and you had both the Clackamas Chinook along uh, the Clackamas River and then the Willamette Tumwaters at oh, Oregon City at West Lynn, which are related tribal families, but there were uh, villages there and uh, the lodges and things like that. Um, and then just uh, uh, west of uh, the, the Clackamas were the Tualatin Kalapuya that went clear into the Beaverton area, Gaston area. Um, that area, and then along the foothills of the Mala um, Cascades were the Malala peoples. Um, and then the Cascade of Hulala people lived from about Sandy River roughly, they'd come down actually into the Portland area also, and up to the Bonneville Dam, Dam area where there was a series of rapids. <coughs> but all of our, and those are the northern tribes, and then we have uh, other Kalapuya tribes from the, throughout the Willamette Valley, um, Pretty much all the watershed of the of the Willamette River upper watershed is Kalapuya country, and then Umquas from the Umqua area, and then into southern Oregon, we have the Rope River to Kelma, and the Shasta peoples um, um, from southern Oregon, northern California, and through seven different treaties, uh, these tribes were relocated to the Grand Ronde Reservation. Um, so it's a pretty large area, pretty much from roughly the Cascade, uh, some of the Cascades west to the summit of the coastal range, and then we have Tillamook families. Um, and then we also have tribes that are, um, where some of the tribes were split up and some went to Siletz and some went to Grand Ronde. Um, so we have uh, tribal families uh, from both, some areas from both areas of the ancestral areas. 
but uh, I'll kind of focus today on our tribes of, of the northern Willamette Valley here. And uh, as I mentioned, the economy, um, we have a lot of different or old stories that kind of tell how things came to be. The Tualatin and Kalapui have stories of how um, um, there were different ages, and during those different ages, different things happened. Um, uh, one of those tells about um, where there were lots and lots of people that were on the earth and there was nothing of sickness, um, and the world became full. And then a time came when those people actually became, um, they were the, the rocks and the creeks and things. They became those rocks and, and the creeks and things. Um, we also have as part of those ages where, again, the world was filled up and there's many, many people. And those people became the stars that we see today. So we have those connections to not only Earth, but to, to the universe that our old stories tell about. Um, we have stories of, uh, in Clackabas of, of uh, going to the moon, going to the sun, traveling to those different worlds. And at the Tualatin and Kalapuya, we also have uh, uh, stories like that also of uh, one youth who actually uh, was looking for water here on earth. All they could do was suck water from the trees. There was no water to drink. And so that youth went and he looked for water and he first went to the moon and he took that, the moon a sweet herb and with that herb he shared it with the moon. Uh, well, again, so he actually asked the moon if, if he had water and she said, no, I don't have water. It was sun that held the water. So she gave that youth some sweet herb um, to take to the moon. She said, oh, sun, I, to take the sun and sun, she said, was being spiteful. So he went to to the sun and met the world, uh, the daughter of sun and he gave her that sweet herb and then she showed him where the water was held and so they went to that place, got in a canoe and they brought that, world, uh, that water to earth. So we have stories like that that kind of tell of our connection. We have beautiful stories that tell about the Milky Way and how it's described by our different tribes and about different constellations, also different stories through all our tribes about different, different um, constellations that were known by our people. Um, there's one, about, this is more southern Shasta people about uh, coyote chasing coon and uh, they're up there in the sky and coyote can't never quite catch coon. So we have kind of cool things like that. Uh, we also have stories that tell about how the landscape was created. We have stories of Coyote and how he created Mount Hood. And we have stories of the big floods that came and how the people survived those big floods. And of course, we had the big floods here in the Willamette Valley and we have stories that tell how uh, those big floods came and the people went and fled and they went to the peak of Mary's Peak, which is the highest point in the coastal range. And so they were able to survive at that point in time. Um, there, and we have stories of whale being here in the Willamette Valley. So during those times of when the, the oceans and the seas were here. So our, I guess the life ways of our people are, are truly time immemorial that kind of tell about these things. Um, as mentioned, uh, the uh, Tomanoas has great significance to our, our tribes. Um, it has spiritual uh, significance, cultural significance. And I was told and presented during one of those the early court case was that the use by the tribes of, of the Beaterite for those, those kind of ceremonial spiritual purposes. Um, the water that was collected in those was used to dip arrows in for good hunting. Um, and for healing and other different kinds of things like that. Um, so it had great, great significance to our people. And, um, you know, they had an understanding that this, that this thing, this special um, um, object had significance and that it did come from, um, from, not from earth, but from the skies above. Um, 
So that, that was truly important and what made it significant also to them. So um, Melinda just kind of gave a brief overview of, of its history after contact and where Hughes found it on the other property, tried to sneak it away on his, and there was the lawsuit, and that's where the testimony about the tribes were presented, but it was considered private property, so it was returned to the steel company. Um, and then eventually it ended up in New York. Um, and as mentioned, um, our tribes did um, 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 through the NAGRA, which is the Native American Graves uh, Protection Act, did file a claim to have it returned to the tribe, um, and then the museum sued, uh, but that resulted in the uh, agreement that was made between the tribe and the museum um, in, re in regards to that it would stay there in New York as long as it was on exhibit. But once it's off exhibit, um, not on dis public display, then it would be returned to the tribe. And our people are very pe patient people, so we're hoping that one day truly it will be returned back to the homeland. But we also have a program also that's part of that agreement where we actually go back annually. Um, they have an internship program for our tribal youth. Um, so our youth kind of go back each year, some representatives, and they, they work at the museum on different kind of things there at the museum. And then they also spend time uh, with the Monowis and sharing the tribal connection to it. Um, so they spend a few days there kind of just sharing with the public those kinds of things. Um, I went back a few years ago and was able to, these, the three youth here that you saw that and was chaper chaperoning with them, um, but they were there um, through that program. Um, here they're kind of sharing uh, the tribe's connection uh, to Tomonis. And they also kind of do a kind of a big presentation about the tribe, the tribe's history and culture, and then the connection to it. Here's some um, uh, an artist from the um, uh, PNCA actually kind of worked with the tribe and they actually did a 3D scan of the meteorite while we were back there and kind of did a kind of an art exhibit kind of thing and kind of talking about its journey back back to Grand Ronde area, back to the homelands, to the ancestral lands. And so this is on the reservation. This is one of our old buildings there that we, when we got restored, the old tribal de uh, uh, train depot. Um, and this is one of our well-known locals with this truck that everybody would see all the time and is helping to bring that, that tomorrow is back home. Um, and then the other is with our tribal dancers, our canoe dancers there, um, dancing with the monos. And so it was kind of an exhibit that we had there at the tribe uh, in regards to that hope and belief that one day it will return home. Um, at, as mentioned, there have been several pieces um, that were cut from, from it. And uh, the tribe, as one, one was, was mentioned, was the evergreen that was returned to the tribe. Um, we've had uh, at least another piece that was returned. Um, there's still several pieces up there. I know OMSI still has pieces um, in other, other locations. Um, but um, <clears throat> we've been fortunate to get at least some of those back and return to the tribe. Would we go back there um, each year? Uh, we weren't able to because of the COVID the last few years, so we weren't able to have a delegation back there. Um, but this year we'll be returning. And each year that we go back, we also take a delegation of tribal members to go, and we have a private ceremony with the Monowas um, that we do um, that's close to the public, and so we get to spend time uh, with the, with the, uh, the Monowas while we're there. Um, and that it's just, um, you know, along just kind of thinking of the landscape and, and there's many, many different places that are important and, and that have different 
kind of significance to the tribe, cultural, spiritual, etc. Uh, this is one, one example, but we have many throughout the landscape here. Um, the high peaks um, are important, waterways, things like that, that have great significance. And um, it's just kind of an ongoing battle today to kind of retain and hold on to those things um, and be able to access them. That's one of the biggest things that we have. Um, and then like some of our important points, like on mountaintops and things like that have changed significantly, have been impacted. A lot of them are private property nowadays. Um, so we're always working to try to, to achieve access to those locations and to bring back uh, those ceremonies and places of importance to, so we have to continue that travel connection. And some of them take work and some of them take a long, long time. Um, but as mentioned, our people are very, very patient and have that belief that over time those things will change and that those things will be able to come back to our people. And uh, Tamanolis is just kind of one, one example of that today. So that's just a kind of a brief kind of overview of a, from the tribal perspective or how we see Tamanolis. And then I don't know if Melinda and us, we can take some questions now uh, from any, anybody. that we know of today um, just because of um, just a lot of loss that's happened you know through contact and disease and like that and just kind of one story I remember is uh, there was this one writer talking about one of the Chinookan people and they were out camping one evening and he was looking the Chinookan person was looking at the sky and telling them all these stories about the star, stars and the constellations and the things that he saw um, and then that writer recorded that about a week later that that person died. And so you just have that vast, vast amount of language of, of knowledge that was lost, you know, during that point of time. And so many of our people lost during that time. So, so much of the um, things that are lost. We have a few stories and things that remain, but uh, not theme right now that we know of that specifically retains to the, to the media. Yes? This may be kind of an unquestioned, we were discussing at the table, but <coughs> this is an awfully large meteorite. Mm -hmm. um, presumably a break off from an asteroid, the major, the big asteroid that hit, what is it, how many thousands of years ago in Canada and caused uh, a, a huge die off at that time through North America? Has there been any study or thought to it? maybe connect that with that asteroid again? Um, no, that's the short answer. Okay. Um, the, there, there are some big impact craters in Canada, but they predate the Ice Age. So this is definitely something that postdates the Ice Age in the sense that it was on the ice and was rafted down. So it's fairly young. Uh, well, my, when, I, when, I've, uh, when I learned about that asteroid, mm -hmm. it hit during the or when there was ice? I will have to think about which one. There's also some similarly large ones that were found in Canada um, and brought down by boat. So there's been very little study on the Willamette, other than knowing it's a glacial erratic and a little bit about, you know, one piece. <laughs> uh, there's not really any other information. Paul. Does the lab have policy or dealing with the conflict between the, the needs of the scientific community and the rights of indigenous populations over to control items that are sacred to them? How do you handle that if that comes up? We try to be very, very careful uh, when dealing with meteorites. Um, we were most recently asked to classify a meteorite from the Philippines 
and the Philippines have uh, cultural heritage laws, and a meteorite fell. A dealer went in and arranged to purchase it illegally for a lot of money. The guy that found it had some spare pieces. They went to the museum there. <laughs> Both parties, the museum and the people involved with them, and the shady dealer both contacted us and asked us if we'd classify it. And we were very careful to say no to one of them and to insist on proper documentation from the museum and the government for the other one for permission to get the required type <coughs> specimen. When you classify a meteorite, it is a requirement that a type specimen be put uh, on reserve in a repository, which we are. In terms of historical, Meteorites, we don't collect them. Uh, what we do have, and if Greg wants it, is a vial of rust that Dick collected from the place where he found the Willamette, where the Willamette, he didn't find it, but there was rust, and I'll be happy to give you a vial of rust if you would like it, because we will do nothing with it. It was very proudly given to the lab by Dick. So you, we can talk about that later. Um, we don't have anything in our lab that we would consider controversial. We've been very careful about what comes into the lab because <coughs> there are a lot of places where you can get tripped up. For instance, I can't classify a Canadian meteorite without proper export documentation. Um, and so you wind up having to know the laws for all the various countries and then try to think about cultural uh, importance on top of that. Um, so. It's a complicated answer. <laughs> yes. There's two of you. Uh, well. Do you do chemical analysis to, to relate this particular iron meteorite with other iron meteorites found on Earth and where it goes with respect to the solar system? Yes and no. What you can do with a chemical analysis is say that an iron meteorite is part of one subgroup, which probably came from one parent body. But people will say, I've got a meteorite and it might be a Canyon Diablo. And it's like, no, I can't tell you that. I can tell you if it's the same type of meteorite as a Canyon Diablo. But there are hundreds and hundreds of samples that are the same chemical composition that fell at other locations. So if you lose the provenance of your meteorite, it's gone. And you also had your hand up. First, first question is, what natural processes contributed to the uh, cratered uh, facade uh, of the surface of the meteorite? And two, are there any non-invasive uh, techniques that could be used to analyze it? Uh, and maybe a third question, would the Confederated Tribes ever consider a core sample? Well, that last one is definitely for Greg. Um, in terms of the uh, first two questions, the cratering that you see is due to weathering, rusting. Um, that was the surface that was up. There were leaves that fell on it. <laughs> they stayed wet. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons I have a vial of rust is because uh, some of the rust has gold, small amounts. Um, and it's a natural leaching process that's a side effect of a complicated weathering process. So you basically rusted out holes, okay? Uh, in terms of can you do non-destructive analysis, there are a few techniques. <laughs> um, they don't give you that much information and the Willamette's too big for some of them. Uh, there's a micro CT, uh, for instance, you can get x-rays of a sample that's about the size of a dice. You know, little cube, one centimeter. Not gonna put a Willamette in that type of equipment. So the answer is no, and Greg will have to deal with your last question. Um, I really can't speak for the tribe, but just personally, I, I would not, it, to me it would be kind of desecration. Um, personally, but it would not be my decision. It'd be up to the tribal government that they decided. And then also, I'd probably have a lot of input from the tribal membership. 
just a follow-up question. To what degree does the tribe, uh, the confederated tribes, to what degree do they value science? Um, there is very many different perspectives on science. Um, we have what we call traditional um, knowledge that we have. Like I, I think some of the things that I shared with you from my perspective is science, from the tribal perspective of talking about our relationship to the stars, to the moon, to the sun, to the, to the Milky Way. So I see those kinds of things as science also, um, and not just kind of a black and white, this is science, this is not science. Um, and when we talk about things like Tomonowus, uh, some people will say, you know, that it's not a, not a living thing, but to us it's a living thing. Um, a lot of these things we consider are, as I mentioned, uh, the old story about the people that became the rocks and the people that became the stars. So we see those as ancestors, and all of that kind of ties into um, that perspective of what science is, but our connection and worldview of how we see the world. Are there any other questions? Yes. Melinda, I, I have a fist size meteorite that I purchased from a dealer. Uh huh. Tucson Gem and Mineral Show uh -huh. many years ago. Uh huh. You mentioned provenance. I really have no provenance on it. I have nothing certified. I know I was told where it is found, but I can't verify that. Where were you told it was found? That's probable. There was a whole bunch of stuff that came out of Gold Basin. If it looks like a Gold Basin, it's probably one. But if you were going to classify it, it might wind up as a Nova meteorite. N Nova is a designation for we don't know where the heck this came from. <laughs> when you don't know, you put Nova, and it's Nova, I don't know how many there are, say Nova 283 or something like that. Is there any way I can get it classified so I can know? Sure. Um, I do about 20 a year, and I have a backlog of 500 right now, <laughs> because every unclassified meteorite that Dick bought wound up in our lab, and he bought hundreds of them. So it's not something I'd get to anytime soon, but I'd get to it eventually if you wanted it classified. I can tell you from the way it looks whether it's likely to be a gold basin. Yeah, that would be interesting. Okay? All right. All right. We have one more over here. Um, I don't know, Greg, if you would know, are there other First Nations or indigenous um, U.S. groups that have meteorites and are the stories similar? Uh, I think Melinda mentioned a, a few that she knew of. Um, I, I'm not personally aware of, but I, I know she mentioned some of it earlier. Th there, there are a few. Um, and like I said, one of uh, the more famous ones is the, um, is it Cape York is the one I was saying? Yeah, uh, from the Inuit. There's a whole PowerPoint presentation you can find online about how they took the Cape York and then took some of the Inuit, uh, small child, uh, back with them uh, <laughs> when, they, when they left. So um, it's rather gruesome actually. So yeah, there, there have been a number of other meteorites. I don't know of any that have been the subject of lawsuits and attempts to get them back. Um, that I don't know. I haven't researched it quite as much as I should have. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being here today. It's a historic meeting, I think. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the return of the Tawanawas for us. So thank you.